Minister for Communication of the State of Israel, His Excellency Benjamin Netanyahu. I invite him to address the Assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you greetings from Jerusalem, the city in which the Jewish people's hopes and prayers for peace for all of humanity have echoed throughout the ages. Thirty-one years ago, as Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, I stood at this podium for the first time. <clears throat> I spoke that day against a resolution sponsored by Iran to expel Israel from the United Nations. Then as now, the UN was obsessively hostile towards Israel, the one true democracy in the Middle East. Then as now, some sought to deny the one and only Jewish state a place among the nations. I ended that first speech by saying, gentlemen, check your fanaticism at the door. More than three decades later, as the Prime Minister of Israel, I'm again privileged to speak from this podium. And for me, that privilege has always come with a moral responsibility to speak the truth. So after three days of listening to world leaders praise the nuclear deal with Iran, I begin my speech today by saying, ladies and gentlemen, Check your enthusiasm at the door. You see, this deal doesn't make peace more likely. By fueling Iran's aggressions with billions of dollars in sanctions relief, it makes war more likely. Just look at what Iran has done in the last six months alone since the framework agreement was announced in Lausanne. Iran boosted its supply of devastating weapons to Syria. Iran sent more soldiers of its Revolutionary Guard into Syria. Iran sent thousands of Afghani and Pakistani Shiite fighters to Syria. Iran did all this to prop up Assad's brutal regime. <clears throat> Iran also shipped tons of weapons and ammunition to the Houthi rebels in Yemen including another shipment just two days ago. Iran threatened to topple Jordan. Iran's proxy, Hezbollah, smuggled into Lebanon SA-22 missiles to down our planes and Yahoon cruise missiles to sink our ships. Iran supplied Hezbollah with precision-guided surface-to-surface missiles and attack drones so it can accurately hit any target in Israel. Iran aided Hamas and Islamic Jihad in building armed drones in Gaza. Iran also made clear its plans to open two new terror fronts against Israel, promising to arm Palestinians in the West Bank and sending its Revolutionary Guard generals to the Golan Heights, from which its operatives recently fired rockets on northern Israel. Israel will continue 
to respond forcefully to any attacks against it from Syria. Israel will continue to act to prevent the transfer of strategic weapons from Hezb to Hezbollah from and through Syrian territory. Every few weeks, Iran and Hezbollah set up new terror cells in cities throughout the world. Three such cells were recently uncovered in Kuwait, Jordan, and Cyprus. In May, security forces in Cyprus raided a Hezbollah agent's apartment in the city of Larnaca. There they found five tons of ammonium nitrate. That's roughly the same amount of ammonium nitrate that was used to blow up the federal building in Oklahoma City. And that's just in one apartment, in one city, in one country. But Iran is setting up dozens of terror cells like this around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, they're setting up those terror cells in this hemisphere too. I repeat, Iran's been doing all of this, everything that I've just described, just in the last six months, when it was trying to convince the world to remove the sanctions. Now just imagine what Iran will do after those sanctions are lifted. Unleashed and unmuzzled, Iran will go on the prowl devouring more and more prey. In the wake of the nuclear deal, Iran is spending billions of dollars on weapons and satellites. You think Iran is doing that to advance peace? You think hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief and fat contracts will turn this rapacious tiger into a kitten? If you do, you should think again. In 2013, President Rouhani began his uh, so-called charm offensive here at the UN. Two years later, Iran is executing more political prisoners, escalating its regional aggression, and rapidly expanding its global terror network. You know, they say actions speak louder than words. But in Iran's case, the words speak as loud as the actions. Just listen to the deputy commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Quds Force. Here's what he said in February, quote, The Islamic Revolution is not limited by geographic borders. He boasted that Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, and Yemen are among the countries being, quote, conquered by the Islamic Republic of Iran, end quote. Conquered. And for those of you who believe that the deal in Vienna will bring a change in Iran's policy. Just listen to what Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, said five days after the nuclear deal was reached. Quote, Our policies towards the arrogant government of the United States will not change. The United States, he vowed, will continue to be Iran's enemy. while giving the uh, mullahs more money is likely to fuel more repression inside Iran, it will definitely fuel more aggression outside Iran. As the leader of a country defending itself every day against Iran's growing aggression, I wish I could take comfort in the claim that this deal blocks Iran's path to nuclear weapons. But I can't. Because it doesn't. 
This deal does place several constraints on Iran's nuclear program, and rightly so, because the international community recognizes that Iran is so dangerous. But you see, here's the catch. Under this deal, if Iran doesn't change its behavior, in fact, if it becomes even more dangerous in the years to come, the most important constraints will still be automatically lifted by year 10 and by year 15. That would place a militant Islamic terror regime weeks away from having the fissile material for an entire arsenal of nuclear bombs. That just doesn't make any sense. I've said that if Iran wants to be treated like a normal country, let it act like a normal country. But this deal, this deal will treat Iran like a normal country even if it remains a dark theocracy that conquers its neighbors, sponsors terrorism worldwide, and chants death to Israel, death to America. Does anyone seriously believe that flooding a radical theocracy with weapons and cash will curb its appetite for aggression? Do any of you really believe that a theocratic Iran with sharper claws and sharper fangs will be more likely to change its stripes? So here's a general rule that I've learned and you must have learned in your lifetime. When bad behavior is rewarded, it only gets worse. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've long said that the greatest danger facing our world is the coupling of militant Islam with nuclear weapons. And I'm gravely concerned that the nuclear deal with Iran will prove to be the marriage certificate of that unholy union. I know that some well-intentioned people sincerely believe that this deal is the best way to block Iran's path to the bomb. But one of history's most important, yet least learned lessons is this. The best intentions don't prevent the worst outcomes. The vast majority of Israelis believe that this nuclear deal with Iran is a very bad deal. And what makes matters even worse is that we see a world celebrating this bad deal, rushing to embrace and do business with a regime openly committed to our destruction. Last week, Major General Salehi, the commander of Iran's army, proclaimed this. Quote, we will annihilate Israel for sure. We are glad that we are in the forefront of executing the Supreme Leader's order to destroy Israel. 